here we are. We've talked about the oscillator. We've talked about the PLL circuit. We've talked about signal flow, the compressor, and even looked at the back of the unit. It's finally time to talk about what is arguably the centerpiece of the Synchrodyne, the filter. The Synchrodyne as a module excels at creating distorted, dirty, and otherwise outlandish sounds. But in order to get the best understanding of the module and all of its knobs and switches, let's start by making it sound like a clean, normal filter. So let's initialize the unit for filtering. Our filter type is set to low pass. Our ratio knob will be at 50 to 1. The input attenuator on the VCA is all the way down. Resonance is all the way down. And we'll be looking at the 2-pole or 12 dB bioactive output. The very first and a very important thing to understand is that there is gain and distortion available on the input. It will distort what you feed into the filter if the input is past 12 o'clock. To demonstrate this, I'm going to hopefully throw an oscilloscope up on the screen. Right now I'm feeding a static triangle wave into the unit from the DPO. As I turn up the input attenuator, everything seems normal until just shy of noon. Once I get to noon and go past that, you can hear the higher harmonics coming in as well as see the rounding off of the signal on the scope. If I turn it all the way up, the distortion is clearly audible. If you want clean, undistorted audio, only open up that attenuator about halfway. Now, the distortion sound can be really great, and with some resonance, we'll get you very close to a Roland 303-ish type sound at the four pole output, but for now, let's leave it at noon. For this demonstration, I've set up a sequence using a saw wave from the DPO. I've also got the same envelope that is controlling the VCA also routed to the cutoff knob, but we'll leave that at zero for now. Let's hear the sequence. Let's lower that a little bit. Okay, so that's our baseline for what we're going to hear. Let's start attenuating the high frequencies by lowering the oscillator frequency and therefore the PLL frequency and therefore the cutoff of the filter. Let's add some resonance. At this stage, you can already start to hear some of the self-oscillation on the filter. At full resonance, the filter is self-oscillating, which adds a sine tone on top of the filtered sound. This is where we can examine the first quirk of the Synchrodyne. Adjusting the multiplier of the PLL will adjust the position of the frequency cutoff relative to the frequency of the oscillator. To rephrase that, the higher the multiplier is, the lower the frequency of the oscillator is relative to the cutoff of the filter. Which sounds confusing, but let's explain it with an example. So I'm going to start up that sequence again. And note that with the multiplier of this position, I start hearing my attenuation at about noon. Okay. But if I were to turn the multiplier up a several degrees, I'm not going to hear attenuation until my frequency of the oscillator is way lower. So now with the frequency multiplier all the way up, I don't hear attenuation until here. But if I were to turn it all the way down, I'm not going to open up until the control is almost all the way open. Why does this matter? Well, if you're feeding in a sequence or you're self-oscillating, it will change the frequency of that oscillation relative to your cutoff. So here you can see we've got very high frequencies near the cutoff. Conversely, I could have lower frequencies near the cutoff. If 
For now, I'll leave it right in the middle, but that's basically the effect that these have. Um, they're not super critical where they are if you're just using it as a filter, so you can kind of play around with those. The last interesting note is while we're at the top talking about the PLL circuit, is if you were to send the track speed all the way up, and as long as you don't have the damping control all the way up, you can get some cool distortion um, near the cutoff frequency. This is just here because I have the track speed all the way up. So I typically leave the controls close to noon while I'm doing filtering. If I have one complaint, um, it's that there's not a lot of travel between full open and when the filter is starting to act. But that's a small complaint. Now let's look at the ratio switch. The manual says that this switch adjusts the frequency ratio of the switched capacitor filter. Now I'll probably do a how switched capacitor filters work video in the future, uh, but what you need to know practically speaking is that the ratio switch affects two things. Uh, the overall brightness of the tone and the location where you'll start to hear aliasing relative to the cutoff frequency. At lower cutoff frequencies where the audio starts to get fully attenuated, you will hear what's aliasing from the filter. Aliasing is an artifact due to the digital sampling nature of the filter, um, but let's listen to that. So now everything sounds fine, sounds fine. And then you have this weird kind of chirpy, blurpy noise down here. Um, what the 50 to 1, 100 to 1 ratio switch will do is change where this occurs relative to the cutoff and will also attenuate high frequencies. So let's open this back up all the way again. The first thing you note is as soon as I engage this switch, we'll hear some high frequency attenuation. So that's with it in, here's with it out. And this is just a function of that switch. So it's a bit of a trade-off. You'll have attenuated higher frequencies, but now let's turn this down. And we don't have much aliasing until we get pretty far down. So there's less aliasing that occurs close to full cutoff of the audio frequencies. If we go up to 50 to 1, you can see that there's aliasing higher up. It doesn't get rid of the aliasing, but rather it shifts it by an amount that I believe the uh, manual says is an octave. So this switch won't get rid of aliasing, it just kind of moves it around and it also affects the tone. Um, I usually have it up at 100 to 1 just because uh, it removes the aliasing sound, that kind of blurpy sound which I don't always want, um, but it's up to you. At this point, let's look at the different filter modes and outputs. First, we have the low pass, band pass, high pass switch, uh, which do exactly what you think they should do. So we're in low pass, band pass. the demonstration I'll leave this in low pass mode. Along the bottom of the OG Synchrodyne we've got the four filter outputs. Uh, two pole, two pole wave folded, four pole, and four pole wave folded. Here's another really big important lesson. There are two wave folders on the Synchrodyne and they have nothing to do with each other. The first wave folder is a single stage wave folder that has no adjustable controls. This is the wave folder that you can hear uh, on the wave folded outputs. Again, there are no controls on this wave folder and the other wave folder uh, knobs and switches have nothing to do uh, with the output based wave folder. Think of it as a fixed non-adjustable distortion. It sounds really good, so let's take a listen to the four outputs. So here we've got the two pole output that we've been listening to so far. And then we'll switch to the two pole wave folded output. So you can hear that extra distortion in there. And I think here I'll add in a little bit of the envelope to the uh, filter signal. And we'll go to the four pole output. Now this one always seems like it has a little bit of distortion on it. A bit less. 
press envelope. And the four pole wave folded output. Really nice, nasty tone here. So those are the four outputs from the main module. As we've said in other videos, there are other outputs over here, including the VCA output, the wave folded output, the two minus four pole output, two pole notch, four pole notch. Let's listen to those real quick. So the two pole minus four pole um, output is exactly what it sounds like and is basically similar to a bandpass output. In fact, I almost like this a little better than the normal bandpass output. Again, you can hear that aliasing as you get closer to the bottom. My unit may be broken because I've done all sorts of things, I've tried all sorts of stuff, but my two-pole notch filter does not do anything no matter what I do. Again, I could be doing something horribly wrong. Doesn't matter how I have anything set. This one doesn't work. But, for whatever reason, the four-pole notch filter works. So this is a notch filter, the inverse of the bandpass filter. Not as useful. I really like this, full, this uh, output. I think that sounds pretty good, especially once you start distorting it a little bit. But for the rest of this demonstration, let's go back to the two pole or the most kind of tame output. Another super important note, if the second wave folder is engaged, again by this switch, the knob at the input is no longer an attenuator, it's the wave folder depth. So let's see what that means. So I'm going to open up the filter all the way, take all the resonance, and I'm going to turn on the wave folder. And now you can hear the wave folder. Actually, maybe I'll switch over to a sine wave. It's a little bit better to hear the wave folder. So it's actually a lot like the DPO wave folder, where the first little bit of travel acts as a VCA, but after that you're doing the wave folder depth. Now if I have the wave folder engaged, now if I have this wave folder engaged and I switch to the wave folded output, things get really dirty. And this is just a sine wave input. So there's a lot of signal being added there. Some nice slow modulation of this sounds really good. So I'm going to go back to this. I'm going to go back to our saw wave. Turn the wave folder off. Note that the cutoff frequency of the first filter can be controlled by the second oscillator by moving the switch on the top of the expand to its lowest position. So I move this down to PLL2. I've actually started my sequence, but nothing's going to happen until I adjust this one. Now what all this does is affect the cutoff. Obviously the resonance and everything stays the same over here. If I go back to the switch up here, PLL1, now we're back on this one. And if I put it in the middle, they kind of do this tug of war thing. Which can lead to some interesting results, especially when you start messing with this switch. But we'll go back to uh, PLL1. stop that. Also, as a function of having the Synchrodyne Expand installed, we have the 
uh, compressor, which is in line. Which can be especially helpful if you have higher resonances so things don't get too out of control. And then you can adjust these to fast or slow um, attack and release settings. Which is kind of neat. There's the compressor on. And then confusingly, right next to the input on filter 2, there's a filter in that doesn't say where it goes, but this filter in is another input that goes to filter 1 even though it's right next to the input for filter two. This input on filter one will bypass the VCA and the wave folder. So if I move my input over to here, turn my resonance down and start again, now it doesn't matter what I do with this knob or what I do with this wave folder switch. So this is just an extra input that bypasses the attenuator and the wave folder. One thing we'll also look at while we're here is the filter on the Synchrodyne expand. So they mirror each other. There is a VCO, there's a POLL, and there's a filter. The filter on the Synchrodyne has all sorts of extra jacks and all sorts of options and all sorts of stuff. Uh, while the filter on the Synchrodyne Expand is a fairly straightforward uh, four pole low pass output only filter. Conversely, the PLL on the Expand has all sorts of extra jacks, all sorts of extra controls that are not on the PLL of the Synchrodyne. Um, and the oscillators are a little different. There's pulse width modulation on the pulse wave output, which I mentioned in a previous video. But uh, briefly, let's take a look at the filter on the Synchrodyne Expand. So I'm gonna move my input over. I'll raise our cutoff. And then similar to the other uh, module, if I raise the multiplication factor, what I basically do is change where the color cutoff frequency will exist relative to the oscillator frequency. Now the interesting and kind of frustrating thing to be honest about the second filter is that it will self oscillate um, if you basically look at it the wrong way. So I'm going to start the sequence again and watch how far I can get up this before it uh, starts to self oscillate and you hear that sign tone again. Right there. You can already hear it. Which means the whole top half of this is great for screaming resonances, but it's kind of rare that I really want that. Now, it's a great sounding filter. In fact, if I move the envelope over again, uh, one volt proctor input. I mean, that's just a good sounding filter right there. A little bit of resonance. Right there is the most I can get before it starts to self oscillate. So again, not as many options as the Synchrodyne Expand. There's not the wave folder circuit. There's not all the other stuff, but still a good filter. The one thing it does have is the clip output, which basically just adds a whole mess of distortion. I think I could still hear some high frequency content. But anyway, those are the filters and the filter outputs and the filter controls of the Synchrodyne and the Synchrodyne Expand. They are curious creatures. Um, these are some very interesting and uh, dynamic modules. And by modulating all of these things, by changing the different uh, parameters, you can get some really uh, crazy, dirty tones out of these, but they also work as great classic filters. It's just, you know, as you go throughout all of your stuff, you end up with your VCA too high, you got the wave folder on, but you weren't expecting it. I mean, these can do all sorts of unintended things. So a nice thoughtful progression through all of the controls um, really helped me when I was learning the modules. So hopefully you found this helpful and we'll work on more Synchronine stuff, especially some of the goofy things on the Synchronine Expands PLL in the future.